But again, I tell you, be in prayer for the ones that are traveling in our families and the ones that are not here, and uh, be in prayer for the ones that are here. Uh, and you know what beautiful singing, what beautiful singing we had. Uh, and you ever just thank God for allowing you to be a citizen of the United States of America? I mean, you're a citizen of the greatest country that's ever been. And, and God planted you here for a reason. You didn't just happen by chance to be American. You're an American because God put you here at this time, in this place, in history. And, and then it's talking about the author of our liberty. And you know who the true freedom is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so those are some things that I think we need to remember. And, and then, the, you know, we could just about went home just after the singing because, number one, you, felt how, you should feel how blessed you are to be an American citizen. You should be thankful for the ones that gave their lives, that gave us this kind of freedom. But most of all, Jesus Christ gave his life. And then Robbie and them singing, All My Hope. Uh, you know, the Lord speaks to you in a lot of different ways. Uh, yesterday I heard that song on the radio, and I'm thinking, you know, I'd love to hear that in the morning. And, uh, and I'm thinking, here it is, he's playing it. But all my sins are forgiven. And again, that is true freedom here on this July the 4th weekend. And I've been washed by the blood. And do you ever do this? Do you ever just thank God that your yesterdays are not only gone, but most of all, they're forgiven. Most of all, they're forgiven. Now, this is probably the most time I've ever had to preach. Uh, this thing got a little sh short because of the pandemic. And I'm thinking y'all are pretty blessed because this has never happened to me either. I run out of paper. <laughs> I was going through and I changed a few things and I, and I tore this page out and then I tore another page out and, and then when I get to the end I only had one page left and I thought I'm not rewriting this whole sermon. <laughs> so not from laziness I don't reckon I just didn't want to do it. I just ended it on that last page. So uh, the lesson this morning, uh, the message, is walking in love. Walking in love. Uh, and I don't know if I've ever preached on this passage or not. I've read it a lot. I know I've done Sunday school lessons on it. And I try to save my older sermons to go back and make sure that I hadn't. But you know what, this is what the Lord laid upon my heart. And so this is the message, and it comes out of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Uh, and when I'll give you time to get there. And I reckon we need somebody to keep time for us. William, if I start to go past 11 o'clock, wait, raise your hand back there, will you? Or you can just stand up and holler, Amen, brother, it's time to stop. One of the two. So, uh, I would tell you, if you got tired of hearing me talk, say that, but we better just go on time. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. It says, Be you therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it be not once be named among you as become a saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this we know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an adulterer, 
hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not you therefore partakers with them, for you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, and walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, again we thank you for allowing us to be a citizen of the United States of America, Lord. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be in this great country where we're allowed to sing to you praises to you, Lord. We're allowed to pray to you. We're allowed to read our Bibles. But Lord, we also say a special prayer for the ones that are not here, Lord. You know the reasons they're not. We just ask you to bless, protect them. But Lord, as we get ready to go through this sermon here this morning, we just ask that not what I would have said is said here, Lord, but what you would have said. And Lord, we ask that people will open up their hearts Receive the word that you would have us hear here this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, part of the reason you got this message this morning is I had two or three different messages. And yesterday me and Joette was at Lowe's picking up a few boards. And I bet I had moved plywood there hundreds of times. And all of a sudden, I, it twists around and comes off that stack, and the corner nails my big toe on my right foot. I'm up in the plywood laying down, trying to hold my foot, and it's like a knife buried in that thing with the nerves coming through. Some two men come down the aisle, and they, this kind of embarrassed me. They felt sorry for me and loaded my plywood on the cart. <laughs> And that guy says, are you okay? Are you okay? I said, it's my toe. I said, I can't stand it. It, it was bleeding. And, uh, but anyway, make a long story short. Uh, it, it's walking in love. And, and like I had been against a couple gift messages, and I'm not sure God let the plywood fall on my toe so I would preach this this morning. But I know that this is a fact from not only teaching health and PE, but coaching, and also from experience. When something causes us to walk different, it causes us health problems in other areas. Uh, when you start to limp, your back will start to hurt, or the other side will start to hurt. You get uh, other parts of your body that causes pain when you get other ailments to your body. But you know what? Each one of us, and this is what we need to keep in line, mind here this morning. Each one of us have a behavioral walk. And you have a behavioral walk that the world is watching. If they know you are a Christian, then the way you treat people and the way you live your life either points other people to Christ or it points them away from Christ. There is no middle ground that you may be point people towards Christ. So you need to keep this in mind. Uh, and so we're either demonstrating Christ as love and character, or either you're a Christian is hiding the fact that you're a Christian, or you're either a non-Christian. And those are the only three th ways that you can be. Now, you could be not walking in the ways of the Lord, and you can backslide, and you can have times when the devil takes over your life and puts you in a bad direction if you allow him to do this. And then you are one of the Christians who are hiding behind the fact of your walk. But in verse 1, it says, be you therefore followers of Christ as dear children. And do you understand that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, our children? You know what? I'm a real firm believer in this, and I know it not only from experience, which can be embarrassing, but I also know it from teaching school. Because I taught school long enough that I had most of my students' moms and dads and I used to make this statement, and if you were one of my former students, 
then don't take this personal. But I would make a statement a lot of times to another teacher when they would be in the lounge complaining about this kid. I would say, listen, I had their mom and dad. You're pretty blessed. <laughs> okay? So you need to think about that. Uh, but, but you know what? Our children follow us. And they imitate us. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7c, it says, For whatever a man soweth, that he will also reap. Now, you know what? Normally, we look at our children and a lot of times we say, Oh, gosh, we're reaping what I sowed. We're reaping what I sowed. But I do also think you should also do this with your children. Because I am a firm believer that 95% of the time your children act like good people. Just like 95% of the time you act like a good person. But we all have moments. So as parents, when we're talking about we reap what we sow through our children, we also need to look at their good actions that they comp copied from us. And usually all we do is look at their bad actions and we say, gosh, I don't think I did that much. But guess what? You probably didn't do quite that much. You know, a tomato plant produces more. One seed of tomato produces a lot of fruit. But also I'm telling you that most of the time it is good fruit. Uh, so, number one, we're to be imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is to be our example and our model. He is to be our example and our model. Uh, and you know what? We're not just to think about God. We're not supposed to just admire God. We're not supposed to just adore God. But we are to be a person that when other people see us, that we have imitated Christ to the point that they see Christ in us. And I know I've said this a lot of times in Sunday school and church, but if somebody comes up and asks you, do you go to church? You need to go home and examine your life. The question they should ask you is do you, or no, where do you go to church? Where do you go to church? But his character should be reflected in our character. And then it comes to verse 2. It says, and walk in love. Do you know that God is love? God is love. The number one characteristics that we're to follow from the Lord Jesus Christ is to walk in love. Love for our fellow man. Love for the people we don't like. Love for the people who are unsaved. But most of all, a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you this. To be able to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that he lives his life, you have got to spend time with him. You've got to spend time in prayer. You've got to spend time in the scriptures. You have got to know how Jesus Christ lived his life. So to know that, you have to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This should become a way of life for us. To be able to walk in love should become a way of life. And you know, we should constantly strive to love others like God loves others. And I'm going to repeat that. And if you're writing anything down, if you don't write anything else down that I say, I think you need to write that down. Not only in the, in there, but write it in your heart. We are constantly to strive to love others the way God loves others. 
And you know, Jesus gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ leave heaven, where he was the son of the greatest, of the creator of the whole universe, he also left heaven and come and lived on this earth. He went through every trial, every sorrow, every single ounce of pain that you could feel personally. But he not only did just what Butch Ross feels personally, he did what each and every one of y'all feel personally. And, and when I think about that, I think about what a sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ made for me before he was ever nailed upon the cross. Because he not only was nailed to the cross for my sins, he came to this earth, and again, I will repeat this. He went through every trial, every sorrow, every disappointment that Butch Ross, and you can put your name in there, went through, plus every other problem that anybody in the whole world has ever had or ever will have, so that he would understand how we feel when things go bad. Christ's death was sacrificial. You know what? He gave his self up willingly for us. His death was the ultimate demonstration of love. His death was more than a good example. You know, his death was more than a good example that we should follow. It made it possible, and I'm a, I want you to underline this word in your heart too. All people, all people to experience salvation if they just accept him. For all people. And his sacrifice was a sweet smelling aroma to God. And when you go back and look in the Old Testament, what was considered a, a good sacrifice that the Jewish people made was if it was a sweet smell and aroma that went to heaven for the Lord Jesus Christ, for God. And so when Jesus Christ was sacrificed on the cross, it was a sweet smelling, pleasing sacrifice to God. But you know, not only this, Jesus sacrificed his life for us. We are called to sacrifice our life for him. And that means we're to give ourselves wholeheartedly to him. Now, most of you are married or you have been married or, or you have, maybe you hadn't. And I probably shouldn't make this statement with Joette sitting here. But how would your relationship be with the person that you're married to or you date if you never talk to them, if you never spent time with them? How would you know what they like? How would you know how they feel? And how would you ha know how they would like for you to act? And for us to truly imitate the Lord Jesus Christ, you have got to be in the Word of God. And to be in the Word of God, you've got to pray that the Spirit will t tell you what God wants you to learn from that today. I don't know if you watched Charles Stanley this morning. Charles Stanley was t telling you how to stay on track for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, go to Proverbs 3. I 
I reached in my pocket because I got it wrote down on a three by five card and my three by five card is still laying at the house on the dresser. <laughs> I write a lot of things on those cards, and I will tell you this. If you ever want me to need me to do something for you, if I write it on that card and I lose my card, it won't get done. But in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, he, he says this is the what he based his life upon. And so it is great advice. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thy own understanding. And that's the reason I said you have to pray that the Spirit will tell you what God wants you from this Scripture. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct thy paths. So for us to lay down our life for God, we must let Him direct our paths. Sometimes, though, we think it has to be a huge, dramatic event of something that we're sacrificing for God. But oftentimes, God just calls us to lay down our lives little by little. Nothing drastic, little by little. It can be a kind word to someone intentionally making sure you give a kind word to somebody. It can be a smile to somebody who needs a smile. It could be a small donation to someone who's struggling. It can be a hug. There's a lot of ways that you can lay down your life for the Lord Jesus Christ in small ways. But the number one way to lay down your life for the Lord Jesus Christ is to allow Him to control your life, to give your life to Him. And that is no only, that is really and truly, I look at it as not a sacrifice. Because if I let Jesus Christ run Butch Ross's life, my life runs so much better, I am so much happier, and things just seem to work out. Now, that don't mean I don't have trials, tribulations, and I don't have a lot of sorrow. But it means that I can know without a shadow of a doubt that no matter what happens, he's going to take care of it. Okay. It's like yesterday, and I will use this example. Jordan, me as a little one, about this tall. We have her down at the campground we're at Rock Springs, and we're doing some work. And she's helping Joette paint. And she tells her, says, you know, Jesus is going to take care of everything. Jesus is going to handle it all. Okay. And that's not exactly the words that she put it in, but it's exactly what she meant. Jesus will handle it all. And then in verses 3 and 5, it's talking about ways that we do not please God. It says, but fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving thanks. For this we know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, nor covetous man who is an adulterer has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ of God. You know, Paul encourages us to remove ourselves from these activities. Or people who behave this way. Contrary to God's characteristics. Now you won't know what's right or wrong? Pick up this Bible. It tells you what's right or wrong. It's talking about fornication and that's sexual sins. Whether Jesus says it is actual sin, the act or whether it's in your mind. If you fill your mind with the scriptures, a lot of that stuff don't pop back up. Uncleanliness, that means dirty, immoral behavior. Covetousness, the desire to have something that doesn't belong to us. Foolish talking, 
telling dirty jokes. That means making others. When they say something, you, you make something dirty out of it. You, you make it a sexual comment or something along that. This conduct, and I'm going to repeat this a couple of times, because if you do any of these things, you need to remember this. This conduct is not fitting for a Christian. And then in verse 6, God says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, but, but, but for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You know what? God will punish these kinds of behaviors that I just read out. Also, Paul warned that people who practice this behavior has not, may have not experienced salvation. So you need to re-examine your lives. And in verse 7, here is a warning. Be not, ye, be not ye therefore partakers with them. And what he's talking about here is do not become partners with people who act this way. Do not participate in the things of the world. Do not participate in the things of the world. And you know, we sit here, and I know most of you have heard this thousands of times. If your parents didn't tell you that, you've read it in Scripture. But I can tell you from experience, it is easy to get caught up in the ways of the world. And when it says, do not participate with the world, that does not mean that we do not associate with the world. Because if you would actually not associate with anyone who had some of these characteristics, you would not be feeling, fulfilling the obligation of the Great Commission. And the Great Commission tells you what? You're to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. But I am a firm believer, not only from teaching, but from living life and from having kids. You will never, ever point your family, your friends, your neighbors, the people you come in contact with to the Lord Jesus Christ till you go back to verse 2 of Ephesians and walk in love. You have to walk in love. You have to be an imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ and they have to see Christ in you for them to want what you have. So if we're going to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to this world, we have got to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 8 through 10. Verses 8 to 10 says, For we were sometimes darkness, but now are we light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. You know what Paul reminds us? That we were all darkness at one time. Notice how I said that. We were all darkness. He does not say we were in darkness. Even though when we were darkness, you were in darkness. We were darkness. And that means that the way we lived our life was unacceptable to God. And the reason I bring that up is too many times subconsciously Butch makes a judgment on who he thinks he should invite to Leonard's Fort Baptist Church. Too many times subconsciously Butch makes a judgment on his own of who he would spread the gospel to. Because I'm really not sure they would accept what I'm saying. But I need to realize 
that before I was washed and saved in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I wasn't just in darkness. I was darkness. And if you don't know what darkness is, that is absent from the light of the Lord. Absence from the light of the Lord. Once we were saved, and now we're children of light. Once you were saved, now you're children of light. You know, I don't know how excited that makes you, but it makes me pretty excited to think of the things that God did to send the Lord Jesus Christ. How he let his son go through all the trials, tribulations, lost hope, all the deaths he had to come upon, all the people that he lost in his life to go through all that pain. And I think what probably hurt Christ, I know here's what hurt Christ the most, is when we deny him. Deny him. I want you to think back to when you were in school. Or you might not have to think back to you were in school. But I want you to think about this situation. How did you feel when a good friend of yours or your boyfriend or girlfriend would not tell people they knew you? How did you feel when they just turned their back and went on about their way? How did you feel when you were supposed to go somewhere with somebody and they found something better to do and they went ahead and did it? But you know, that's the way Christ feels each and every time that Butch Ross don't stand up for him. And when I say that, that I don't stand up for him, it don't mean that I have to stand up and jump up in somebody's face and start hollering at them and telling them that they're going to die and go to hell. What it means is, is I not only don't speak up when somebody criticizes him, but I also do not live my life in the way that he would have me live my life because I am denying the fact that Christ is the light of the world. Verse 9, it says, For the fruits of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. For the, spirit, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You know what? He is telling us how to live our lives here. Verse 10 it tells us to proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. You know what proving is? That means testing. And testing is a constant self-examination of the fruit of one's life. That means I constantly look at my life to see if I am bearing the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ. The goal of our testing, now I want you to remember this point too, and this is highly critical in the way we would live our lives. The goal of our testing is not, now listen, it is not to find failure. Okay? Now, when I went through this, and you go look at your life and how you walk with Christ, do not just look for failure. But you should test and look at your life and examine it to find success. Find where you did live the way God would have you intend to live. See t situations where you did show Christ to others and then build upon that success. 
success, build success. And I'll just throw this in if any of you are going to have to take a test. But one time, and I know you don't want to hear past experiences, but I will tell you anyway. When I was getting my survey exam, I failed the first time. I come home, studied for six months, and I, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I bet I averaged at least two to three hours a day studying over a course of that six months. But the most help that I got was I went to a workshop in Jacksonville, Florida. This guy had his law degree in 22 states. He had his surveying degree, his license in 19 states. And he made a living teaching workshops on how to pass the bar exam and how to pass the survey exam. And we, would, we did nothing but for three and a half days but take tests. And he said, success builds success. And when we went in to take the test, I, I, I'll hurry through this because I, I think it's pretty exciting. Y'all might not. You went through and you made easy, put E beside the easy question. He, he said, don't write a thing down for 30 minutes. It's an eight-hour test. So the first 30 minutes, I didn't write anything down. I followed his advice. Write an E beside easy, M beside medium hard ones, and H beside the real hard ones. Then go back and answer the easy ones first. Then go to your medium ones, and then go to your hard ones. And then success builds success. So when I am telling you here, not only from experience in taking a test, but also of experience of living life, you look at your life and you see where you are doing and living the life that God would have you to live. And, it, and then you build upon that. And then you will build upon that. And you will build upon that. Success builds success. We're to find in verse 10 a life that is pleasing to God. You're to find a life and live a life. Excuse me, not find a life. You don't tell me where to, you want me to tell you where to find one that's pleasing to God real quick. We're fixing to have an altar call. You can find it through the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and accepting Him as Lord and Savior. And if you do that, you have done the number one thing that God will find most pleasing, most pleasing to Him. The second way you do it is you live your life in such a way that not only imitates Christ, but points others to Christ. And then I'll tell you, I always tell you when I'm preaching, three things. Give the world a hug. There's somebody out there who needs a hug. Whether that's that warm smile, and I know we're in the pandemic and you're not supposed to wrap your arms around them, but it could be somebody in your family that you could wrap your arms around. And again, will your circle be unbroken? And if your circle is broken, maybe we need to examine our lives that we went over here this morning. And then second class citizens change the world. Second class citizens change the world. We sit here a lot of times and we think, I can do nothing to help the kingdom of God. I'm saved, I'm washed in the blood, I'm going to heaven. But I can't do anything to help the kingdom of God because I've been too bad. I've done too much. And my friends will look at me and say, there's no way that you could have changed. There's no way you could have changed. You know the hardest place to be a prophet? It tells you in the Bible. It's in your own land. That's where people know you. People know what you did. People know your history. Or either they're listening to their mamas and daddies tell stories about you. But second class citizens change this world.